uh, I'm the composer. Um, I am connecting to you from rural Vermont. Uh, so if you can't hear me all that clearly, that's why the internet's not great out here. Great, thank you. And Rod, as our title character, I'm gonna toss it to you next. Well, uh, this is Rod Gilfried joining you from Rancho Cucamonga, California, where we've lived for about 25 years now. Um, um, well, what can I say? This was a fantastic experience for us to do Crossing. We premiered it a few years ago in Boston, then we did it um, at BAM in Brooklyn. And we did it in Los Angeles in concert. And then this at the uh, American Civil War Museum was one of those outings pared down a bit. It's not the entire piece, but we did excerpts from it. It's always a pleasure to sing. And it's one of my favorite, one of my favorite roles. Great. And Mackenzie, can I toss it to you next, please? Yeah, of course. Uh, my name is Mackenzie. I'm coming to you from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, I uh, was not involved with the original productions uh, of this piece, but I was so happy to uh, join Rod and Matt for um, the, this condensed version that we did uh, last year at the museum. It's a, it became a, a really special piece, and I think particularly right now, timely. Fantastic. And Matt, could you tell us a little bit more about the origins of the piece? What inspired you to write Crossing and uh, how did it come to the museum? Well, I've always been fascinated by uh, Walt Whitman. He's, a, he's a, an operatic spirit, um, larger than life. Um, you know, the kind of guy who was just uh, big in everything he did, super, super generous, you know, someone who would drop everything and, and work as a volunteer nurse during uh, another national catastrophe, you know, the Civil War, um, but who also invented this language for American poetry, you know, sort of broke it free of, of uh, what he thought of as the, the shackles of, of European um, poetic forms and really found something that a language that behaved like this raging river that, that he thought of as really American. Uh, and I was also fascinated by uh, his life story that he was, uh, we would now say that he was a gay man, but uh, he was kind of uncategorizable for the 19th century. Um, so Crossing is this kind of dreamlike exploration of what, what the guy's inner life might have been like, uh, specifically during uh, during those years, uh, during the Civil War. And, you know, Mackenzie mentioned that it, it feels timely. And, and there have been a couple of moments uh, when it, the pieces felt a little bit timelier than I expected. I think we, we premiered it in 2015 uh, in Boston, and then we did it in 2017 in New York. And, you know, there was a certain election in 2016. And I think it, it, the whole thing felt resonant in a different way when we came back to it in 2017. And it's funny uh, talking about the piece at this moment because uh, uh, I think that maybe our current crisis is not on the level of a civil war, but it's the biggest crisis our country has faced in, you know, probably since World War II. And it's the, it's the first time I think that, that people are being called um, to volunteer. You know, I have friends who are doctors or who, who work in the medical profession but are not specialized you know they're not they, they shouldn't be doing this work but they have to kind of volunteer and jump into action and it's been a long time since people have done that um and crossing is also an examination of what happens in those in those kinds of extreme circumstances yeah. Rod or mckenzie i mean this was something that resonated with me as i saw it last spring and then watching it again this idea of even human connection in the midst of chaos or crisis, but was there anything that resonated with you as you are thinking about this again, or just revisiting the ideas of crossing in this moment, or even just as you come back from a performance and then come back again to another performance? I, th I think something that, that 
Um, I, I was struck by when I started working on this and continue to be struck by is the the power of of an intentional relationship, the power of um, of compassion and kindness, and the way that that choosing uh, compassion and kindness can change another person. Um, in, in the opera, the I, I did the character of John warmly, and um, you know we see him at the beginning of the piece, and he's he's uh, withdrawn and 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 angry and and kind of has that feeling of, of bitterness to him and, and defensiveness. And by the end, um, you know, he's a, he's a completely transformed person because of, of the generosity and, and the kindness uh, that Whitman showed him. And I think that that's a powerful lesson for us to, to be thinking about. Um, certainly in, in these times, you know, we talk about uh, Matt was talking about that this is a we're living a massive crisis and we're living in a nation that's that's utterly divided there are so few things that we can actually agree with each other on and or so it seems in our in our in our politics certainly um, and I think that that lesson of, of compassion and kindness and and, and generosity is something that um, is important for us to, to be thinking about and to be considering in our relationships. Yeah, I think uh, Whitman was Whitman was sort of famously generous and famously loving and sort of abiding by his own principles. In this story with John Warmly, his, his love is really tested. And I think that's what we're seeing today as well as people's, mm. people's love and compassion is really being tested. How much compassion and love can they have? Will they put themselves in a dangerous situation to help someone else? In these, in these kinds of uh, national and international crises, uh, the best of people tends to come out and the worse it gets, people tend to get, unless it turns the other direction, but people have extraordinary acts of love and generosity. From a personal perspective, man, I miss people. I really miss people. You know, I'm, I'm teaching remotely. I'm a professor at USC. I'm teaching all my students remotely. I'm, I'm um, doing faculty meetings remotely. Um, just a couple days ago, we decided, uh, my, my, my wife's also a teacher. She teaches kindergarten. She did her first class with 27 five-year-olds on a Zoom conference this morning. It was crazy, but kind of wonderful. And we discovered a few days ago that my, my sister-in-law, my wife's sister, who lives across the street with her husband, they've been quarantined as long as we have been. So we figured none of us are sick. So we formed a uh, COVID-19 pod and started having dinners together a couple nights ago. And tonight we're going to have our second one because, you know, we're in it, we're in it together. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, gosh, being, being, to, being with people is really, you know, it's, it's a great thing. And especially in our business where we're so collaborative. It's not like I'm a solo, a solo violinist or a solo pianist. Uh, everything I do is collaborating with other people. And um, this has really, really made that super evident. Great, thank you. So I've got a question that's coming through the chat from Mary. And she wanted to know a little bit more about what was it, the writing process behind this, and especially how much of this was fiction? How do you write feelings and emotions into this? Um, what did you create, and what was based on this? That's like questions I extrapolated on Mary's question. So I just wanted to. Uh, I lost the last bit of that, but I think I got the I got the gist. Um, I started from Whitman's diaries. Um, he kept uh, extraordinarily detailed um, diaries of, of of this period. And actually, you can tell that this was uh, kind of the seismic event of his life, because um, you know, at the end of his life, when he published a, a full autobiography, the war takes up about seventy percent of it. <laughs> it's like this, you know, this is the this is the thing that that leaps out. Um, so I started from his own uh, accounts and, and he was very 
very patient. You know, he, he, he really cared about um, uh, humanizing everybody he met. So the diaries are largely, uh, you know, accounts of uh, people, often people who died, uh, people that he met, that he cared for, somebody that he brought some alcohol or, you know, wrote a letter for them or, or whatever it was. Um, and when you, when you take the whole scope of the diaries, you realize that it's this really poignant effort to maintain one-on-one -on -one human contact in a, in a moment when uh, hundreds of thousands of people are, are dying. And it's because the Civil War was really the, wor the first time in American history where the numbers were really more than the brain can, can process. Um, so I started from, from, from those diaries um, and uh, then the, the rest kind of departs. The rest is fiction. <laughs> uh, the character of John Wormley is someone who's mentioned, uh, he's one of those entries. He's, he's mentioned very, very briefly. Um, and it, the entry struck me because he's described as being kind of suspicious and sallow looking. And he's one of the few soldiers who kind of looks at Whitman like, what are you doing here? You're, you're not like all the other nurses. Um, and so I kind of expanded that into a, 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 a more fleshed out uh, character. Um, so yeah, the, the, the writing process was one of, of trial and error. We did two uh, big workshops, which, you know, Rod sang, sang both of them. And so he basically had to learn <laughs> about three different versions of the piece by the time we got to opening night and then another version by the time we got to New York. Um, but that's usually the way it is, it, the way it is with me. You know, I start with this raw material and then you refine it and refine it uh, over a period of years. Great. And what is that like carrying the stories and Walt Whitman in your head and revisiting that over a period of years? Um, it's, it's funny. Uh, the piece premiered almost five years ago. Um, and so now I have a certain perspective and a, a distance from it. And so I think, you know, I think we all feel a, a, a kind of affection for it. You know, this piece is an old friend. Um, and I think that Whitman uh, represents the best and also the most extreme versions of being an American in various ways. He was psychotically optimistic about what America could be. You know, even in the middle of the Civil War, he was going on about how this was going to be the greatest country, you know, people were going to remember this. And, and so I think as I've returned to this piece over the past five years, that has struck me. There've been moments where I've thought, wow, you know, Walt Whitman's slightly naive optimism is also my own. Like I, I made some of those mistakes, but they're also really beautiful mistakes because they, they, they do give energy. Um, so I guess that's, that's what I've returned to is, 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 is Whitman as this, um, this, this kind of, prism through which we can we can view the struggles that we go through in America because <laughs> he he was so generous he was so messy he was so willing to to get his hands dirty uh he had this crazy unshakable optimism even when he was in this these horrible circumstances um it's you know it's it's worth it's worth revisiting because it, it can be the basis for some real self-exploration I wanted to say something about the edited material because it just occurred to me that I have the uh, the two, 2014 version in my library here. I called it, I called it Whitman Opera O'Coin 2014 Workshop. And inside you can see, here's the cover that I put on it. Nice picture of Walt. But inside- Self-portrait. How much, how much material there was. This is in 2014, and then when we get to the to the 2018 version, it's that thick. That's how much material. Which one's, the 2018 one's not as long, right? 
No, 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 no. Yeah. He was way thinner because he cut so much. It was like he took his precious baby and cut the arms off uh, off of it. <laughs> I have a lot of respect for Matt. It had a lot of arms. It had a lot of arms. It was like a, it was like a, yeah. anyway. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Matt because he had, was in this constant editing process. You know, I learned a lot of music that I never will sing again. I'm keeping this. I'm going to post, I'm going to publish it under my own name in a few years. But um, uh, Matt has an amazing ability to see the, see the, 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 the trees while in the forest. Is that what you say? He has a kind of an objective viewpoint where he can look at the whole thing and everybody's like, oh my God, that is so great. It's so beautiful. He's like, nah, I think I'm going to cut that part. What? But I, he ended up with a great piece. So he did, he did a fantastic job of editing his own work. So I'm going to pull a couple of questions from the chat and combine them into one. There are multiple requests to know if there is a recording of the entirety of the opera if there are ways that people can hear the whole thing or even share it with folks like students who might be interested. So uh, there does exist a video uh, from BAM in New York, but unfortunately it's not publicly available at this moment. And we have not yet made a studio recording of the full opera. We really, really hope to, um, but it is tricky um, and, uh, uh, and also quite expensive to, uh, to, to gather the forces for that. Uh, I should mention actually, uh, uh, among friends here, you know, Rod will remember this. We talked about recording the piece this spring. Um, and at this moment, I feel very glad that we did not sink tens of thousands of dollars into that recording because it absolutely would not be happening. So, but we really hope to get a recording out eventually of the full opera. Thank you. And Rod, Annie says you can tell that you live with a teacher with all the binders and divider tabs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so um, let's see. Elizabeth Wollen, who, full disclosure, is affiliated with the museum. Hi, Betsy. <laughs> uh, she says, this was such a wonderful first event for the opening of the American Civil War Museum. It involved the story of the North and South, Black and White, linking music, poetry, and history. Matt, are you finished crafting this piece? And is it likely to be for performed in full again? Well, I'm really glad you enjoyed it, Elizabeth. Um, uh, I, I hope for my sake and also for Rod's sake that I am done crafting this piece. Um, I hope it will be performed in full again. Uh, we, just, uh, we just performed a new opera of mine called Eurydice. Uh, at the Los Angeles Opera uh, last month. So uh, my focus has been on uh, a new piece for the past few years. And um, now that that other piece is, is alive and kicking, um, uh, I can focus some energy on, on finding some more productions of, 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 of Crossing, so. Oh, I see there's a follow-up question mm -hmm. about the current pandemic uh, commenting on the current pandemic and how it's affecting people in the arts. Yes, um, you know, I think at a moment like this, you, you really realize how many wonderful artists out there are, are living on the knife's edge. You know, people who are, are, are succeeding at making a living at what they do, um, but they ha maybe they're on the younger side. Uh, maybe the pay is not steady, um, and it means that there's just not a safety net for a lot of people. Um, so, uh, especially in the world of you know classical music, I can't speak for a lot of other fields, but I know the classical field really really well. Um, it's not a field where people are making the kind of money you make in 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 in, in some fields. Uh, and it's also a, a, a line of work where a lot of people are freelance all the time. I mean, Mackenzie, Rod, you guys know as opera singers that it's, uh, it's not exactly, uh, it's not like you're ever going to make partner, <laughs> you know, at, a, at the opera singer firm um, and, and, uh, and, and have it just be a, a, a sure thing forever. And Mackenzie takes a drink at that. Um, 
Only it was something so it's, stronger. It's a really rough moment, and I've been, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I've been really heartened to see the way that people have been supporting artists and artists have been supporting each other. Uh, I've been involved uh, with something called the New Music Solidarity Fund, if I can sort of take a second to plug this thing, which I think is doing great work. Um, New Music USA, which is an organization, is, um, uh, is, is creating a fund to support people who work in, in the field of bringing new music into the world, which almost never pays well. Um, and uh, creating a kind of emergency funding, emergency grant system. Um, but that feels like a, uh, you know, that feels like a, a life jacket um, and you can't live in a life jacket for all that long. Um, so, you know, I hope we see some real social reorganization as a result of this because it's really exposing uh, what a rough spot, what a tough spot a lot of people are in. Yeah. Got a question from Rachel that's on a similar um, theme here. But as artists in quarantine, are you discovering? Oh, wait, hold on. Are you discovering newer, different ways to stay productive or creative, or are you taking this time to reset or meditate? I'm a big proponent of rest. I think that um, I think that often in our society. Um, Productivity is is valued a lot more than than stability. Uh, I don't know if that's exactly the right word, but uh, I say all that just to say I'm I'm a big proponent of rest. It's not that I'm putting down creative endeavors or or um, learning upcoming projects uh, and things like that, but uh, for, for me, I'm definitely taking some time to to be more reflective, um, to invest more than I would have the opportunity to in my, clo uh, in my close relationships um, and, and not do my best not to, to worry about what comes next. Uh, yeah, I've had quite a, bit of, quite a bit of work canceled due to the uh, coronavirus and I was, I, I was an hour from going to the airport to do a beautiful recital of Poulenc and Stravinsky in Virginia and um, I got a call an hour before I was to go to the airport that it was canceled, and that was sad. And then I had a, another job here in Southern California that got canceled. I've got one coming up in Amsterdam that's most likely will be canceled. And you kind of wonder what to prepare for. You know, I start preparing mm -hmm. for my next thing, and I'm like, why am I bothering? It's going to be canceled, you know? So I hope that doesn't keep happening. <laughs> um, of course, I, I'm in a very lucky position because I'm a university professor and I have that as a, uh, as a steady monthly income. So uh, that's fantastic. Uh, I've been taking the time, of course, to learn how to do online teaching. That's a whole nother, a whole nother thing. But my wife and I have both had a chance to you know, spend more time together. I don't have to do my, my almost daily commute into Los Angeles, which is far from here. Um, you know, I've done more gardening. I've done a lot of cooking. I love to cook and I've been cooking almost every single night since we went into this situation. And um, so there, you know, there are positive things from it. I have to say also from, a, from the standpoint of teaching that I, my wife and I both, but I just speak for myself, we've learned things about just out of necessity, how to teach things online one-to-one -one with no, no other collaborator like a pianist in the room. So I'm teaching singers who are singing most of the time a cappella. And I've learned stuff. I've learned some very valuable things that will probably become a part of my teaching in the future. Um, so in that sense, uh, you know, we're expanding our horizons while staying quarantined. We're, we're expanding our skill set. Um, getting to know each other even better after 39 and seven eighths years of marriage, if that's possible. And um, we just can't spend any time with our kids or our grandkids or our neighbors or, you know, any of the people we love, except for my sister-in-law, brother-in-law across the street. But um, yeah, it's a mixed bag. We'll, we'll get through it. And Rod, we've got a question coming in for you that says, do you mind sharing what you use for online teaching of opera or singing? Uh, Jean has a friend who needs to get something like that going. Okay. 
Well, I use Zoom because I teach at USC and they are supporting Zoom. Uh, we log in through a secure portal so that we don't have problems with this Zoom bombing phenomenon that has ruined so much online teaching where people out of, you know, they, they hack in and they post pornography or whatever it happens to be. Uh, so we're, we're using Zoom. Is it perfect? No. Is the sound bad? Yes. Is the, are the, are the connections shaky? Yes. Um, now, because my, my singers are not allowed to collaborate face-to-face -face with their pianists, and we can't really have a pianist in a separate location participating in a voice lesson, the time delay is just so severe that everything just falls apart. Either I have my students do a cappella, or I, I sit at my piano and you know give them pitches for exercises. Or I've also been advocating an app called App Companist. Now, pianists will cringe at this, but it's actually pretty good. It has thousands and thousands of classical and musical theater songs, just the piano accompaniment. Um, you can change it to any key you want, any tempo that you want. There's a little fermata button so you can extend the length of a phrase if you need to. Um, it's proven to be pretty darn good. There are some, it's surprising how much repertoire there is available. So that's one tool that we've been using. And um, there's also a thing called voicelessons.com that some of my colleagues are using. I have not tried it out yet, but it's specifically made for teaching voice lessons over the internet. So we're almost out of time. So I'll ask kind of one parting question before we go. So thinking about the themes of crossing or the history behind uh, that informed the piece, if you could give our attendees here just a parting piece of advice that draws on those themes or the history that speak to you or that you think is particularly salient, what would it be? I wonder what, uh, what Walt would say. Um, Walt was great at, uh, at big historical perspective. And I think that's really useful here. Um, uh, the fact that yes, this is like, we're living in a kind of nightmare, but also we're better equipped to fight something like this than any earlier generation. Uh, and that something like the, the, the pandemic of 1918 or really anything before then information wouldn't have spread um, in the same way. Uh, and so I found that I've been, I've been sort of uh, taking comfort in the fact that it's like, well, what we're doing is pretty extreme, but if we lived in any other time, we probably wouldn't even know that we should be quarantining in this way. <laughs> so I think there's an upside to it. And, uh, and Whitman would probably say, think 3000 years in the future. Think about those future generations. Uh, uh, and and uh, and 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 take comfort in uh, in that vast perspective. I think there's a good comparison with what happened during the Civil War, a, a national crisis, and uh, what it does to people. What it how how. There is an opportunity for people to come together. There's an opportunity for people to uh, to work as a team and to drop ideological and political differences and turn to care and caring and turn to love. And I think this is what Walt would have advised people to do. He was a real uh, humanist, and I think that we have the opportunity to appeal to our 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 human side our compassionate uh loving side and make this current crisis into something that can make us all closer and make us all stronger um i think that's probably what's going to happen um i hope that's what happens um but uh we shall overcome and we'll, we shall overcome even better if we all band together and solve it as a big one big community.
I can't consider myself any kind of authority on uh, Whitman, certainly not um, as studied as, as Matt or Rod are, but um, I, I would certainly say that uh, a theme that I'm struck by is that, that we're always going to be stronger when we, when we work with each other, when we work from a place of understanding and kindness and genuine love for each other. On that note, thank you all for joining us and thank you all for allowing us to share this wonderful program again with everybody here tonight. And please be well, stay safe and, and healthy. And thank you all for attending this evening and bearing with us on this kind of one of our first programs like this. So we'd love your feedback. Feel free to shoot us an email. Uh, you can reach me at S-A-R-D-U-I-N-I -I at acwm.org or Julini at acwm.org. Also, just a reminder, we've got two more virtual programs coming up this month. So on Monday, April 13th, uh, is our first of two history happy hours. So we'll bring the history, you bring the food and beverage, and log on to Zoom. You can register on our website. It's a free program, but the topic on the 13th will be bread or blood. That'll talk about the Richmond bread riots. And on the 27th, we'll do another history happy hour called Limbs Lost and Found. So weird stories about famous amputated limbs. <laughs> so thank you again, and please stay in touch with us on social media. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Bye, Thanks. everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.